Hi, I'm Eric the Travel Guy. Today, we're on the West Coast in Southern California. Now, don't be jealous. The perfect weather is just the beginning. The gorgeous community of Long Beach is next on Beyond Your Backyard. My name is Eric Hastings. Yeah, that's me. And for as long as I can remember, I've always loved to travel, and I still do today. But you know what I've learned? There's so much more that brings us together than divides us, which is why I've made it my mission to do the very same things you can do, but to take you beyond the experiences, to uncover the soul of every place we visit. Let me introduce you to the people, the places, and the secrets that remind us how exciting it is to share with one another, to understand one another, and to realize just how connected we really are. I am Eric the Travel Guy, and this is Beyond Your Backyard. Thank you for watching and welcome back. You know, it's another gorgeous, perfect day in Southern California. Yes, it's sunny. Yes, it's beautiful. Now, don't be too jealous because today we brought you to the charming destination of Long Beach, located just south of Los Angeles. You know, this is a very personal small city. It's diverse, approachable, and growing fast. That's why on today's episode, we will show you how I personally learned how to drive and dock a Duffy boat. We'll meet a queen, we'll take in a little art, and we'll show you the art of authentic Mexican cuisine. It's gonna be a good one. Let's get started. Our trusty map shows us that Long Beach is perfectly situated on the Pacific Ocean, about 30 miles from downtown Los Angeles, 30 miles west of Anaheim, and about two hours north of San Diego. Because this isn't a geography lesson, let's move on to the beautiful B-roll. Long Beach has been voted one of America's most walkable cities and is comprised of eight distinct neighborhoods tucked in along the waterfront. Trendy shopping, a diverse collection of restaurants featuring delicious food, world-class museums, and a few one-of-a-kind attractions. The city was incorporated back in 1888 and for about a decade at the turn of the 20th century was one of the fastest growing cities in the United States. The Port of Long Beach opened in 1911, which is why we're starting with the introduction of a legendary ocean liner, the Queen Mary. Captain James, good to meet you, man. It's a pleasure. It's My a pleasure. Gosh. Welcome. Welcome aboard the RMS Queen Mary. This is an amazing show. Welcome. When did she get here? She arrived here in 1967. Legendary. It was in service from when? 19... From, from 1936 up until 1967. And she was doing transatlantic crossings only? Only. At that particular time, but from time to time, she would go to Cherbourg, France. Got it. She would go from time to time to Australia. From time to time, she would go to Canada. It's very difficult to express what you will feel when you're on board. I mean, the, today this is a working hotel. It's certainly a, a place that visitors come and visit. People get married here. Yes, they, they do. They meet here. But even seeing her in the harbor, how do you describe that feeling? of being on board this ship. And you've been here, what, 15 years? 15 years uh -huh. I've been on board the Queen Mary. Uh -huh. The Queen Mary, the feeling that I feel is, she's a giver of life, a giver of love. Uh, can we take a walk? We can do that. Do you mind giving let's us a little take tour? A walk. Right, let's take a little let's walk. Let's take a walk. Time frame for the Queen Mary began in 1926. So 26. That is when the dream started. Who had the dream? The dream was by Cunard. It was. The name, and, and do we know why? Uh, yes, because they wanted something speedy, speedy. And high rate of speed meaning what? Being five days over and five days back. Got it. The Queen Mary was the fastest going sea vessel of her time. And secondly, safer. Got it. This ship is all about craftsmanship. They didn't have a shipyard in England large enough to build the Queen Mary, so therefore they went to Scotland to build this ship. How long did it take? It took six years. During World War II, this was a troop ship. The entire outside of this ship was painted Battleship Grey. She was given the nickname the Grey Ghost. The Queen Mary transported 15,000 soldiers per crossing. Wow. And many of those soldiers slept here. I was going to say, decks. what's the capacity? On these decks. When it wasn't a troop ship. 2,000 passengers with a crew of 1,200. <laughs> We're now entering into main hall. On board the Queen Mary, there was no steerage. Got it. But we did have stowaways. 
This is my favorite room on board the Queen Mary. This is the Queen's Salon. Okay. From the first class passengers only during World War II, this was the officer's lounge on board the Queen Mary. Got it. This is Art Deco. Right. All of the woods that you see in here are original. The artwork that you see in here is original. But directly in front of us is a model of the Queen Mary. This ship was built according to the model that you see right here in front of us. The Queen Mary did not have stabilizers. What does that mean? Up until the 1950s. Stabilizers look like wings on either side of the ship mm -hmm. that project. And uh, when the ship runs into a storm, up until the point that those stabilizers were added, whenever the Queen Mary would run into a storm, she would rock and she would roll. They gave her the nickname, the Rolling Mary. <laughs> And at that time, my friend, they had not yet invented Dramamine. Captain, you may find this hard to believe I did. There's some people that don't know this is an actual working hotel. Yes, it is. And has been since when? Since 1971. 71. Yes. How many rooms? As a matter of fact, we have uh, 347 hotel rooms on board the Green Mary. Can we take a look at one of the rooms? I think that's a great idea. <laughs> It's, a, it's like we went to a production meeting. I love this. <laughs> this couldn't have worked out any better. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Enter. This thing is massive, Captain. Yes, it is. A regular suite could consist of up to 10 rooms. Really? 10 rooms. Why did somebody need them? Because they would bring their butlers, yeah. their maids, yeah. their valets, and perhaps from time to time, even bring their children with them. How did these rooms size up with what was available on the market in 1936? On board the Queen Mary, these rooms are larger. Larger than most ships at that particular time. And then this room, the woods are beautiful. Uh, this ship had over three forests die for it, mm -hmm. as far as woods are concerned. Mm -hmm. So there are 56 different types of woods being used throughout this ship. Come on in. My goodness. This is the helm. This is the heart of the ship, where you would drive and steer the ship. What are we working with here, the radio? No, these are called voice tubes. Voice tubes only work up here in this area, as well as out here in this docking wing on the starboard side, as well as the docking wing here on the port side, as well as in the chart room and beneath us in the captain's quarters. And it went something like this. Ahoy, mate! Ahoy, mate! Fix me a hamburger! I am hungry! <clears throat> and all of that information, in turn, would pass through these metal pipes to its destination. And guess what? They never had one, not one, dropped call. If you wanted to communicate with the rest of the ship from up here in this area, then here, in this encasement, you would use the louder phones. Look at this. Awesome view, man. Oh, come on. This is gorgeous. During the winter, beautiful snow caps. How do you describe this town to people that haven't been here? I describe this town as a city that welcomes any and everyone. Because it's it's deceptively large. It is large. It's what, 450,000 people in, right. in the city limits, That's right? That's right. And just like Los Angeles, we have many things to do here. Yeah, because it's transformative. Yes, it is. Speaking of transformative, I present to you uh -oh. the TV show CSI Miami. Right, there it filmed is. Filmed right here in I'm Long like, Beach. Yeah, you're right. And you know what else? Every April, we have the race cars coming. Oh, yeah. I mean, I love this air out here. It's, it's really stunning. It's beautiful. This is one of the few cities in the United States that you can actually, during the winter, go to the mountains and ski. Yeah. Come back in the same day, come to the beach and lay out. Yeah, and get in the water. And get in the water. They must leave here after even coming to visit for the day. But whether they spend the night or not, they must go home and say, my gosh, that's an experience of a lifetime. The interesting thing is we get people coming back 10 years later yeah. speaking about their experience on board the Queen Mary. That's awesome. You are a, an outstanding steward of this phenomenal place. She fell in love with me once again, and I fell in love with her. <laughs> so therefore, here we are, 
It's unreal. It is unreal. Thank you. Thank you for this, Captain. Thank you for coming on Appreciate board. It. This once spectacular ocean vessel is hard to miss on the horizon. And on select days, you'll also see a carnival ship in port, returning or departing for another amazing exotic voyage. And speaking of water, make time to visit the Long Beach Aquarium of the Pacific. The family will love meeting more than 12,000 animals in more than 100 exhibits, including sharks, penguins, sea otters, and sea lions. It's an attraction that makes sense for Long Beach. And while I enjoyed my time there, I also wanted to take in a little visual art at the Long Beach Museum of Art. Help us out a little bit in terms of, first of all, somebody that's never been here. Let's start with what they can expect when they step through the front door. We have the historic Anderson House, which was built in 1911. Mm -hmm. It's been, had many uses through the year, but in 1950, the city started a municipal art gallery. It started collecting shortly thereafter and became a museum right away. Uh, the collection now is around 4,500 pieces. It uh, has become a significant collection. You know, doesn't the collection have a lot to say about who lives here and who cares about this community? I am so glad you said that because it's so true. Uh, and that's part of the story and about who we are. And it's amazing the roots and the depth that that goes back into with this in the community. So, so for me, the programming and what happens here, I think is really wonderful when you've got that basis to work for. Yeah. And then you take a real hard left-hand turn and you bring artists in to paint on the walls of the museum. It's the audience yeah. that is there that's building and what's happening with this city. It is very exciting. We are the state curriculum for the Long Beach Unified School District for the fifth grade and our curriculum is here. So you have over 11,000 kids per year each of them to have an experience that's going to be memorable and that they're going to want to come back. And doesn't that have everything to do with the message that you're sending, which is art truly is for everybody? Yeah, it's a visual language. It speaks to you in, the, in that manner. Um, I think that people respond to things they see online, mm -hmm. um, but they still want to see the real thing. But we're always talking about what the artist is feeling and what the artist is putting forth, but the artist really is paying close attention to that. Very much so. But they're paying close attention to how people will see, see it. it. Oh my gosh. And that goes from the process uh, of the actual applications of uh, materials and the manipulation of them, but it also goes the process of what the artist is traveling in their brain. And when it hits and when it's successful, you're like, yeah, I get it. I get and it. that's pretty awesome. It's good to meet you. It's good to Thank you for this. My new BFF, Ron, and I could have talked education and the importance of art awareness and understanding by young people for hours. It's clear, as a resident, he's dedicated to his area of study and the town itself. Another one of those cool locals is Jack Morris. He owns Boathouse on the Bay and was persuaded to teach me how to pilot a Duffy boat. So people come to visit for the first time. Are they surprised at how pretty it really is? It's shocking to a lot of people when they do walk in, they don't think they're still in Long Beach. And I have to explain to them, we're on this side of the orange curtain. We're all good. <laughs> orange curtain. And uh, it. so many different things you can do. You know, you can rent a Duffy, you can rent a jet ski, you can rent uh, hydro bikes down at that end. You can go diving. This guy right here has two dive boats that go out every weekend. There's more paddle boarders out here every day. Uh, you can go kite surfing out here too. Yeah, on the other side of the housing over here, you got the kite surfing. On the water side, the ocean side, Right. You know, so there's so many things to see and do. It's just, uh, if you come to Long Beach, there's a little bit of, we have the largest Cambodian community outside of Cambodia. Yeah. Not many people know that. No. So, and they got great little restaurants. Not many people know that. All right, now, first of all, what is a Duffy boat? We have to talk about this. What is it? We're on one. Are we on one? I like to call this the, my limousine on water. Okay. <laughs> and it's, it only goes like five to seven miles an hour. It's all electric. It's good for eight to ten hours. All right. So we take guests out. We, do, we, we donate a lot of this to the charities, and we do uh, a dinner for eight and a Duffy boat for an hour, and we take them out in the bay. Yeah. And we have fabulous music on the boathouse deck every night, so you can just sit out here and just listen to the music. Can we take a little ride? Would you mind? Absolutely. Wait, this is like one of the easiest things I've done all week. Isn't that nice? You just yes. kick back. Yeah. Oh. oh, what are you talking about? I don't even care about this TV show anymore. I'm just going to sit here. And you just sit and relax. Isn't that nice? Yeah. There's no better place to take a break. You can see the downtown skyline right from here. I know it's 85 degrees. Well, we're, it on a, we're on a duffy. We got a little bit of a breeze on the bay. So now go around this buoy. Now slow it down. Okay. I just want to show you something so when you get ready. Who has the right of way here? You. Oh. Get up to the neutral. All the way straight up. Okay. Okay, now. 
you let it sit for a pause so the gears kick in. Now, now you're gonna hit it toward back. Watch, go ahead, back it up. But get ready to spin the wheel the opposite way, right? All the way back. Feel that thing spin now? Keep going back, more oh, speed. Oh, I see. Oh, got it. So then go ahead, hit it forward. Go to neutral, then pause, now hit it. So people can come out here, they have no idea what they're doing. You give them a short lesson and they just take it out? You can rent a duffy next door to us, and they have like 30 duffies. Go around that five mile an hour sign. OK. How quick can I go? Power. Just go ahead, yeah. Go ahead, turn it right to the right some more. Keep going. Just drift. It's all right. Boy, it is a dance, isn't it? You really can feel the water. Oh, yeah. It's cool. So now just make that loop again that you made earlier and come into that dock. All right. I got this. Just let it go and slow it down just a touch more. Go to reverse. Harder. Look at you, look at you, look at you. You're a pro. Yes. Awesome. That was a nice backup. Thank you, man. <laughs> it's my first time. A good team. That came out really well. One of the themes I see emerging here is Long Beach is a town diverse enough to charter your own experience. Big city? Sure, that's close by. The world-class theme parks of Anaheim are a short drive away. Of course, the water and the beach is around just about every corner. Or you can take a ferry over to Catalina Island. The resident population is culturally diverse, and that is absolutely evident in the local shopping and restaurants. That's why I dropped in for a delicious meal at Lola. Always good to meet you, man. Good this, to meet you as well. This, this is going to be fantastic. What are we going to start with today? We're starting off with our birria. Okay. Uh, so it's our family recipe. It's almost like the cousin mm -hmm. of uh, barbacoa. Okay. You know, but barbacoa is from a different region in Mexico. Got it. This looks incredible. How long does it cook? Uh, about four to five hours. You know, the, the pork bone in. By the time we're done, we pull that bone right out. Yeah, and we coat it with the adobo. We, we cook it down, and the flavors of the chilies, and just, it's a flavor bomb. So what we do, you load yourself up. Yeah. Lime or no? Yeah, oh yeah. OK. Now, this is going to be incredible. Go into the lean. See, look at the lean. Got to do the lean. These are not complex flavors, but together, they be, it's like a symphony almost, isn't it? You marry these flavors together, and you know you have the acidity of the lime. They have a little bit of the smoky flavor of the salsa. Well, you know the the meat has the adobo, and our beans. We don't use a traditional uh, pinto. No, you don't. We use a, a Mayacoba white bean, and they're so basic. We cook them down. Garlic, onion, and salt. And it's just such a creamy bean, and the skin's a little bit thinner than the traditional mm -hmm. pinto. That's great. But that's all you need. So it's a very, I guess, indigenous way of cooking. Mm -hmm. But when you put it all together, there's nothing better. Except the other nine dishes we're going to have. Yes. Well, I mean, <laughs> really. <laughs> Let's talk protein first. What's the name of the dish again? This is our cochinita pibil. It's a pig that was brought over from the Dutch into the Yucatan Peninsula, the region. Yep. And then the, the pibil is uh, Mayan for the achote. Got it. So cochinita pibil is a very, very traditional dish from the Yucatan. Mm -hmm. And you roast it underground. Mm -hmm. Banana leaves the whole nine. Mm -hmm. This is our uh, habanero salsa. OK. We got some pickled onions. Love them. Since we're now showcasing the Yucatan, we're using black beans. And then you got the plantain. Oh. And it, if you see that really beautiful, like, orange-red color, that's the achote. It's a seed. It's, it's, it's a hard seed. I mean, it's really, really difficult to pulverize. Right. You know, now, you know, in today's age, they already sell it, you know, yeah. in a paste, or you can get it pulverized. But it just gives it this beautiful flavor. And what you do is you take the achote, with fresh squeezed orange juice, Ooh. and that's how you make this Ooh. this rub. I mean, it's really that's my childhood right there. It's really... <laughs> oh man, I crossed on that situation right there. Allow me, please. Oh, thank you, yes, sir. Cheers, my friend. Cheers. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That is delicious. I love what the corn tortilla does for it. That's a phenomenal flavor. Yeah, the flavor is just amazing. Every section of my tongue 
found something on that on that bike. Nothing was overpowering. Nothing's clearing my sinuses. You know, nothing. It's just this really soft, mellow, yet incredibly flavorful. Everything we do here is made from scratch. Initially with the birria, which is, you know, from where my family's from. Mm -hmm. You know, then we had the cochinita pibil, you know, which is from the Yucatan. Mm -hmm. And now we're going into mole poblano, which is more central. So the mole poblano is the most traditional mole out there. You know, there's so many moles. You know, if you get into like even the region of Oaxaca mm -hmm. and you talk about like the seven, you know, the moles mm -hmm. where you got the mole negro, the mole amarillo, which is the yellow mole, <laughs> right. you know, people were eating what was available to them. And then you look at the history side of it and you see, you know, as I mentioned with the cochinita, which was the pig, which wasn't indigenous to Mexico, but it was brought over by the Dutch. You know, and then you talk about the English influence in Veracruz and, you know, you start moving into this stuff, yeah. you know, which is a mole. I mean, I don't think a lot of people understand what a mole is. Uh, I would be one of them that do. do but it. In, in the original dialect of, you know, the indigenous Aztecs, mm -hmm. uh, mole means to grind. And you would grind the nuts and you would grind the chilies and you would roast them and you would create this very intricate, silky, flavorful sauce. Once you pair the pickled onion with something like this, mm -hmm. you get a complete different experience. But when it comes down to the mole, yeah. the sauce is the star of the dish. And there's a misconception too, because people are like, oh, that's that sauce that has the chocolate in it. Yeah. But the chocolate is just uh, such a small piece of the puzzle when it comes down to a mole. Yeah. And not all moles come with the chocolate, you know, which we're going to see right after this one. What? Right after this we one? We got one what? more. Oh, my gosh. And this is our mole verde. So this stems from Toluca. We're still dealing with the nuts. We're dealing with the almonds. But with the mole poblano, which is a little bit more on the sweet side with the plantains and the chocolate mm -hmm. and the raisins, mm -hmm. this is the complete opposite of that. Oh, I'm going to love it. So now we're talking earthy. We're talking uh, poblano peppers, jalapenos, garlic, onion, lettuce, Italian parsley. Oh, oh my gosh. This is a perfect representation of the culinary passion that is igniting in this town. Good to meet you, man. Oh, thank, thank you for you. not serving dessert. Oh, we got churros coming. Oh, please. And <laughs> You're awesome. Palm trees, the Pacific Ocean, and a community of locals ready to welcome you with everything they've got. Sounds pretty perfect to me. In Long Beach, I'm Eric the Travel Guy. Thank you for exploring Beyond Your Backyard. Oh, wow, now that's a Long Beach. Huh? See what I did there? Subliminal advertising. Ooh, somebody want crack an egg on my forehead? Ooh. Why does he have his eyes closed? Oh, just like in life. Perfect. <laughs> oh, the dreaded closed mouth laugh. Oh, I love that outfit. <laughs> I managed to botch like all every third word. Can I roll the teleprompter back. We literally have a see-through scroll because we don't can't afford a teleprompter. Here's a suggestion. I make. Here's a suggestion. I'm. And I have another tip for you. Wear some sunscreen while you're out here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but also pay a visit to the Pike Place outlet. That's what it's called. And now we play the waiting game. Da, 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 da. Who loves to sweat in the waiting game? I am. I am. I have you. to go back to that mini suite and take a little nap. <laughs> uh, this is nice. I feel like Gilligan and the Skipper all at once. Gilligan the Skipper. It'll crash. <laughs> I've never heard.